Well, good morning. My name is Tim, and I'm serving as the interim pastor here at Lakeside until God provides the next lead pastor for this congregation. And I'm looking forward to that day when God calls the right man to this place. And I know um, we're all praying in that direction. So I want to ask you to continue to pray for the search team in that process. Um, They definitely need that prayer. And prayer unites us as followers of Jesus Christ. It's one thing that we can do uh, to, to unite ourselves as the body of Christ and lift this important request before the Lord, who already knows who this next lead pastor is uh, for Lakeside. So I want to just encourage you to pray in that direction. But today, uh, we're continuing our series uh, called Hashtag Living in Christ. And um, we're going to be looking at chapter 4, which I believe is uh, one of my favorite chapters. In our family, we call this the Better Together chapter. Uh, it indicates that we, though we are all different, and if you look around the room, wow, some of us are more different than we care to believe. Uh, some people, some of you have hair. Um, some, of, uh, some of us don't. You know, there's some obvious, obvious physical differences, uh, but we're all different, and we're different on purpose. Unity does not mean uniformity, and we'll be getting to that in a little bit. But I want to key in on two very important words that are the first two words in this chapter. And they are the words, I therefore. So we need to remember that the Apostle Paul, or uh, the, Paul, um, one of the founders of the Christian church, is, is preaching this message or sending this in, in letter form to the church in Ephesus. And he begins this, this chapter, this portion of scripture with, I therefore. And anytime we see the word therefore, we should look at what came before the therefore so that we understand where is he leading us to. And the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, Paul is wanting us to anchor our identity and our hope and our security into who we are in Christ. But then, right here, he turns to a new direction. He says, now that you are anchored and rooted in Christ and you know who you are, therefore, I want you to live in a brand new way. So now the next three chapters are going to unpack how it is that we live in Christ. And to give us a summary of the last three weeks, um, there is a a brief video. It's about three minutes long uh, that will explain for us kind of the main concepts found in the first three chapters. So take a moment to watch this brief video. Our default position as strugglers is to believe that God's disappointed and frustrated. That he simply is tolerating us. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 says, no, 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 no. Before the foundation of the earth was laid, He was going to adopt you, make you holy and blameless in His sight. So whether difficult days or good days, God's at work. God has not abandoned you in this difficult season. How amazing does that make our God that in our hypocrisy, He's long-suffering with us. In our inability to live out all that He would call us to, He continues to lavish upon us His grace. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us 
in all wisdom and insight. So I love this word lavish, extravagant, plentiful, over the top. And so now when the Bible's talking about forgiveness, it's saying that his grace in forgiveness is lavish, like it's too much, like it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous amount, right? It's, it's, it's weight. It's over the top. It's out of control. Man of woman of God in Christ, but struggling. God does not regret saving you. He doesn't regret it. You haven't surprised him. You cannot surprise him. God is not watching where you are now, watching how you've struggled this week, watching how you stumble and fall, and regretting the decision to pay the price for you and for You have no sin, past, present, and future that has more power than the cross of Jesus Christ. None. This means that your salvation wasn't just a past event alone, but that Christ even now is continuing to save you. He didn't forgive your past sins and now leaving it up to you to conquer present and future sins, which means it doesn't matter how you came in here. It means God can rescue. It means God can save. And it means for those of us who are in Christ, you do not disgust him. You do not disgust him. You don't know what I struggle with and how deplorable it is. Um, I know that Jesus would say that he paid the bill in full, and so what you're saying is nonsense. That is the grace with which he lavished on us in his forgiveness. In the first three chapters of Ephesians, we see the word grace a lot. In the concept of grace, our undeserved um, Mer- our, our undeserved favor with God, that God has given us what we do not deserve. And it is amazing to think about the grace that God has given us. But Paul doesn't stop there just saying, you have received this awesome grace. He's saying, now live in light of that grace. Don't be stuck just thinking that it's an etern- internal thing. Have that affect the way you live your everyday life. And so three key words that we're going to be talking about today are unity, gifts, and new life. (laughs) Unity is an amazing thing. And if we look at what Paul is asking us to do, in this passage he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If we look at this list, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain unity, it does not describe us as people on our own strength. The only way it is possible for us to live that kind of way that Paul is saying, this is how I want you to walk, is by the grace of God. We cannot live, I by myself will be proud. I by myself will not be gentle but angry. I by myself will not be patient but I will be impatient. I will not bear with other people in love. I'll want them to get it right instead of messing up. And I will not be eager to maintain unity. I'll be eager to, eager to maintain my own selfishness. And God, uh, through Paul, is calling us to become humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain unity. Now, unity is an interesting thing. I've gone off to pastor prayer summits, and at these pastor prayer summits, um, it's amazing. You get 50 pastors in a room, and the, the per- I know, that's kind of funny right there, isn't it? Um, so you get 50 pastors in a room, and the facilitators say, you know what? What we're going to do, we're not going to talk about, about prayer. We're going to just go to prayer. And we're going to see what God does as we pray. And my experience at these pastor prayer summits has always been one of as we pray, 
though we are very different, God unites our hearts. And usually we meet from 9 a.m. till about noon on that first day. And at noon, we take a break for lunch. And at lunch, we stop praying and we start eating. And as we're eating, we start talking. And the comparisons start. And disunity happens. So when we are looking at our horizontal relationships, when we are looking at each other, we began to pick out what is different instead of what is the same. We begin to say, oh, you know what, that guy is an older pastor, so I'm not going to associate with him. I'm going to go hang out with the younger pastors. We walk away. We start asking, so how many people are in your congregation? Not a great question, and it doesn't even matter. Um, but we ask those types of questions, and, and disunity starts happening. And pretty soon, by the end of lunch, there are theological debates happening around each table. And who's right and who's wrong and why they're right and why the other person's wrong. And so prayer unites. Grace unites. When we think we are in control and we think we know the best way to go forward, um, disunity happens. In this passage, it goes on to say, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. By grace, uh, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So, there's a lot of ones in there. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. What Paul is trying to indicate to us here is keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Don't fix our eyes on the various differences among us. Fix our eyes on what is it that unites us. And what unites us is the grace of God. The grace of God has the power to unite us. Imagine that I got up here very early this morning and right in the middle of the ceiling of this room, I put a central, central point and I then put together, um, I hung strings down from that central point and on the end of every string, I put a tennis ball. And every string was exactly the same length. And then imagine that we took all the chairs and pushed them aside. And that we all grabbed a tennis ball. And on the count of one, two, three, we all dropped our tennis ball. They would all collide in the middle. Because they're fixated on a central point. Now when the church is functioning, sometimes we compare our our following Christ experiences with one another. And we do that on a horizontal plane. Instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus, saying, you know, what is it that God is doing in this congregation? And what is it that we can do to fix our eyes on God and what he desires to have for us? So in this passage, all these ones are indicating that we are one body. Though we are made up of very different parts, though we are each uniquely gifted, and, and the world would say that we need to be with like-minded people. We need to find the people that we are most like and, and be with them. The church, we have this glorious opportunity, though we are different, to be united. Now, like I said before, being united or unity is not the same as uniformity. We should not say, let's try to all of us become exactly the same kind of person. We're all different on purpose. God united us in our differences to be stronger together than we are apart. That's why this, this message is called Better Together. We are truly better together. So when you see a difference in someone else in this congregation, praise God for that. 
look at that and say, you know what, that other person, I would not know, um, I would not know the fullness of Christ apart from being a part of the body. And Christ is the head. He leads us and guides us forward. But each one of us are uniquely wired by God on purpose to live out his purposes within his church. And now the passage goes on in, in uh, verses 7 through 16 to talk about some specific gifts that God has given some people in the church. And these specific gifts are apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And they're, they're found in verse 11, if you're looking at the verses, and it says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for, work of, for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all attain unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. If we want to experience the fullness of Christ as the church, there is a specific way God has wired up the church to work. And now God gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. He gave some. There's, a, there's an important word in there, some. He did not give all people these particular gifts. Though he gave us, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, he gave each one of us spiritual gifts for the advancement of the gospel in this world. He gave some, though, the ability to uh, be apostles. Apostles are people that start new things and have a heartbeat to start new things. These would be your church planters, your, dis your forefront disciple makers, your people always starting new things. Sometimes these people annoy the church to no end because they're like always starting something new and never finishing it and sometimes that can be frustrating you know we look at that person and go can you stop starting new things we need to take a break from you and we need to have you follow through actually those starters are very important to the kingdom of god they need to go start new things i have a friend who Every single year when we were working with an organization called Young Life, every single year he would start a new area. So he'd start it with about three or four kids, and they would start the ball rolling, and he would build that youth ministry up to about 30 or 40 kids. And a year later, then he would move to a new area and start all over. And people are like, you're just getting it to like being awesome, and you leave. He's like, my heart is to start new things. And that is how the Lord e wired and equipped him. Uh, the second type of person on this list of leadership gifts is a person uh, known as a prophet. And a prophet isn't necessarily someone that can tell the future. This is a prophet that is a truth teller. And the church also does not like these people. Uh, if you are a prophet, whether it is Old Testament or New Testament, you're boldly speaking truth that no one wants to hear. And as people um, step up into these gifts of being an apostle and prophet, uh, they're not typically well-liked, but God gave certain people those gifts for the edification, for the building up of his church. Now, the church does like evangelists because that brings more people in. And the church loves people that have a passion for evangelism and are able to train and equip other people in how to share their faith. I have a friend who almost every week, there's someone that he leads to the Lord. Almost 52 people a year come to know Christ uh, because of this man's ministry. And he's like, I just, I can't stop it. It just happens. God gives me an opportunity. I can't help but share the grace of God and, and the gospel with people that are far from God. And they just happen to pray when I'm present with them. It's not anything I do. I, I have no magic uh, wand to make it happen. It just happens. 
And evangelists are people that the church desperately needs, not just to fill seats, but to make an impact as we go out into the world. The church is not about us coming together only. It's about us being trained and equipped as we gather together to be sent out as missionaries. And lastly, it talks about shepherds and teachers. And these are usually gifts that go well together. And these are usually talked about together. A shepherd is someone that cares for a flock. And a teacher is someone who teaches what the word of God means to the body. And some, some people have the gift of being a shepherd teacher. Some people don't, and that is okay. It is important that we identify what our gifts are and use them to edify the body of Christ. And these specific gifts were given to bring about unity and so that the church would be living the way that it should be living. In verse 16 it says, from whom, from whom the whole body joined, to, joined and held together with, in, or joined together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow up so that it builds itself up in love. So if the body is working correctly, if the church is working correctly, it is continually being built up and encouraged as these people, as these leadership gifts are being used by leaders that have them. So the, the whole goal is that the church would be working appropriately, working right, and living on mission to go make disciples and adore Jesus each and every day. The last part of this uh, chapter talks about living in a new way. It talks about taking something off and putting something on. It specifically talks about taking off lying or taking off lies and speaking the truth. It talks about taking off anger and replacing that anger with peace. It talks about taking off theft or taking stuff from people and being generous. It talks about becoming a person that takes off gossiping and using our words to encourage. It talks about, instead of giving, getting revenge, it talks about forgiveness. And instead of promiscuity, it talks about living a self-controlled life. And instead of getting drunk with wine, it talks about being filled with the Spirit of God. And this taking off the old and putting on the new is a unique thing. Now, a number of years ago, we had a friend, and they had a seven-year-old daughter, six or seven years old, and they were wanting to teach this young lady to kind of take care of herself. They're like, you're old enough to start taking a shower by yourself and dressing yourself and taking care of yourself. And so the mom gave this young lady a very important instruction. She said, every day... I want you to put on a clean pair of underwear. Now, that's great advice. It is, I, I think we should all be doing that, by the way. I think that's a great, great word of encouragement. And um, about six or seven days into this girl learning to kind of take care of herself, um, the mom noticed that her pants were a little puffy. And... Um, the mom said, could you come over here, honey? And this young lady walked over to her mom, and the mom said, could you unbutton your pants? And sure enough, there were about six or seven layers of underwear, and that's why she was kind of puffy around the midsection. And the mom gave a very clear instruction, put on a new pair of underwear every day. Now, the mom did not give the full instruction, right? She should have said, take off the old, then put on the new. Now, many of us, um, probably many of us even in this room, have a bad habit of, of what I call spiritually puffy pants. Um, 
Call me weird, but what I'm saying here is that many of us don't do business with God and receive his grace that he grants us. We don't take off the old before we put on the new. What we do is we say, you know what? I'm just going to ignore the reality that I lie. I'm just going to try to my very best to speak the truth. But if we don't confess our sin of lying to God and say, God, my sin of lying is offensive to you. I need your grace to transform and change my heart so that I live out of the truth. If we don't take off the old and we only put on the new, it will show up at some point. And many of us are wearing spiritually puffy pants. You know, we, we have the old, and what we decide is we're like, you know what, I have a problem with lying, but I'll just put truth on over it. And I have a problem with anger, but I'll just do my very best to put peace on over that. And hopefully all people will see is peace, but inside I know I'm still angry. And instead of, um, you know, I'll cover up the idea that I'm taking things from people that I, are not mine. Instead of theft, I will um, just appear generous. I'll make it a, an appearance of generous generosity. And the truth is we, we begin to live a, a dualistic life at that point. We know our true self. We know that we're still living out of the old self, but we're trying to convince everyone around us that we're living out of our new identity in Christ. And most of us walk around with spiritually puffy pants, and I'm convinced that there is one reason that we walk around with spiritually puffy pants. And it's the reality of if we take off the old before we put on the new, there is a time we're naked. And that is very, very uncomfortable. Being vulnerable before God, saying, God, I have taken, I've, I've confessed my sin before you. There's a time we're naked until God clothes us in his righteousness. Until he puts on the newness that is truth and peace and generosity and encouragement and forgiveness and self-control and God's spirit. By the way, we cannot attain those on our own strength. There is no way. We cannot. If you try to, what will end up happening is you'll live this dualistic life and you will be torn apart. You'll not be united and you'll also notice sins in other people more than you notice sins in yourself. When we come before God and we say, God, I confess all that I am, as sinful as I am, before you, and I want to receive your grace, he does a, a process of cleaning house. And it's a beautiful thing. It's exactly what we need him to do in our lives, but it is painful. The reality of coming naked before the Lord and saying, you know what, this is who I am. Take me or leave me. You know what, he will accept you. He does not accept you because you are perfectly, you live a perfect life. He accepts you because he is a perfect God. If you walked in here this morning thinking that, you know, my sin is so bad that God could never love me, Realize that God's love is so much bigger than any sin anyone could ever commit. God's love and God's grace is available to you this morning. And it will not stop. His love is unconditional. His love is unending. And his love will stop at nothing. He is pursuing a relationship with each and every one of us. If you do not yet know Christ and you're sitting in this room... I'm praying and hoping that today is the day that you encounter the grace-filled gospel of Jesus Christ. If you've been walking with Christ for many, many years and you've been trying really, really hard to get this Christian life right, 
I'm praying that this would be the day that the grace-filled gospel of Jesus Christ would give you new life. That you would realize that you cannot change yourself. If you could change yourself, Christ came for nothing. But he came because we cannot change ourselves. The transforming power of Jesus is what each and every one of us need every single day. There's not a day we don't need it. In fact, there's not a second we don't need the grace of God. So if we look at the reality of this passage and we unpack it, um, I could talk about this passage, this chapter, all day long. But I know we don't want to stay here all day. Uh, So if we just put it in a nutshell and go back to our, our key words of unity, gifts, and new life, we look at this reality that we are united by God's grace. There is no other way we could be united as the church. If it were up to us, we would figure out a way uh, to be, uh, us to be right and other people to be wrong. There are over 430 different uh, denominations of Baptists alone in our country. That shows you there's some disunity. There's 433 or something like that, different Baptist denominations in the United States alone. That's just a picture of disunity. But by God's grace, we can live united as the church. We are gifted by God's grace. Did you know you don't get to pick your spiritual gifts? Isn't that weird? Um, You would love to be able to, I know. And sometimes we look at someone else and we're like, oh, I want what they have. No, God wired you up uniquely you to be you. And I know some people, I have some friends uh, that are prophets. They have this spiritual gift of prophet, prophecy, and they, they're like, I don't want it. I'm like, I'm sorry, but God in all his wisdom chose you to be a prophet. He, he gave that to you. And any spiritual gift we have has been given to us by God for the edification of his church. And so it is by grace that we are gifted. And we are also made new by God's grace. I hope you guys are catching a theme here, that it is God's grace that unites. It's God's grace that gifts us with the gifts he's given, and it's God's grace that makes us new. We can't do any of this on our own. On our own, we will be disunified. We will judge people for their their gifts. We'll envy other people's gifts. We'll do all these things things that are are awful and we won't live in a new way we'll live in a old pattern so my prayer this morning is that every single one of us would realize the grace of god in a brand new way that we would say you know what god unite us help us not look at the differences among us but help us look at what are you doing with lakeside Secondly, that we would not envy other people's gifts, but that when we see someone else using and living out of the gifts that God has given them, we would just be overjoyed for them. God is using you. Awesome. Like that should be the way the church should should work. We shouldn't be envying other gifts. We should be praising God for other people's giftedness. And we should also be identifying our own giftedness and say, God, use me to serve in your church. And the reality is, it's not an obligation to serve in God's church. It's a get-to. It's not a have-to. It's a get-to. We can say, you know what, God, how you wired me up, and then you, you wired me up specifically, and then you brought me to a church in Algoma, Wisconsin, specifically at this time for a reason. Honestly, every single one of us that are a part of this church should be serving in some way. And not because we have to, but out of the joy, out of receiving God's grace and wanting other people to taste that same grace. 
we should be motivated to say, you know what, I want to go reach this community. I want to reach Algoma. I want to reach Kiwani. I want to reach Sturgeon Bay for Jesus, not because we have to. God's not going to be happier with you if you serve him. He loves you, but our model of what it means to serve in the church is Christ. Christ served us, therefore we get to serve others. Christ loved us, therefore we get to love others. Christ sacrificed himself for us, therefore we get to sacrifice. Christ suffered on our behalf so that we might have life, we get to suffer too. That is awesome, that's a high privilege. And lastly, we can't live a new way. We can't live a new life apart from God's grace. On our own, we are bent towards selfishness, but God's grace brings about a humility in us that causes us to say, you know what? I desire to let Jesus change me, and as I am changed day by day, all of a sudden that new life is what comes out, and that's what people see. They see the tip of the iceberg. They see the tip of what God is doing in our lives. So I know that God is alive, God is well, and God is at work at Lakeside, but not only at Lakeside. He wants to go work through Lakeside to affect this surrounding area and potentially even plant churches. And I, I don't know. I, I don't know what God's vision is for this congregation but I am very excited to see what he will continue to do in the coming days, weeks, months, and years ahead. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you have brought us together on purpose today. Lord, there is no mistake that each and every one of us are gathered in this room right now. Lord, it is by your sovereign will that we are here, and it is to receive your grace. Lord, I pray that as we receive your grace, that your grace would transform our hearts, that we wouldn't be pride-filled, self-centered people, Lord, but that you would create in us a humility. Lord, that we would walk in a new way, that we would be walking in humility, gentleness, patience, that we would bear with one another in love, that we would be eager to maintain unity in the Spirit. Lord, that we would realize that we are one body by one Spirit with one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father over all. Lord, I pray that we would realize that you have gifted specific people to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherds, teachers. And Lord, I pray that the church would be living to its fullest potential here at Lakeside. And Lord, I pray that what that would bring about is new life. Lord, by your grace, we pray that that would happen in and through your church. In Jesus' name, amen.